Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. What does luck mean to you? And does that change depending on your circumstances? That's what Joyce Maynard writes about in this week's essay. It's read by Jackie Weaver, who's been nominated for Academy Awards for her work in Silver Linings Playbook and Animal Kingdom. You can see Jackie this summer in the new series, Perpetual Grace Limited, on Epics. The room where I'll spend the day, if I'm lucky, is fluorescent lit, lined with hard plastic chairs, and has a reminder on the wall concerning the importance of hand sanitizer. Though friends offered to accompany me, I'm here alone. On the opposite side, a family has gathered. A man in his early sixties, like me, and four young people around the ages of my children. They're engaged in cheerful-sounding small talk about their jobs, the Red Sox. As for me, I don't feel like talking to anyone. I arrived a little after 6am, after kissing my husband goodbye before they wheeled him into surgery. The surgery is expected to take 12 hours, though somewhere around hour three, the surgeon will have gotten to the place in Jim's abdomen where he can see the tumour, known to us only as an innocuous-looking grey area on Jim's CT scans. Sometimes this turns out to be the moment when the surgeon discovers the tumour is not operable after all, in which case they stitch everything up and say, we tried. The tumour in question, I haven't allowed myself to call it Jim's tumour, I don't want to see him take ownership, is 2.5 centimetres in diameter and located in the head of Jim's pancreas. For my husband to survive, to have a shot at survival, this tumour must come out. The operation calls for the removal of part of Jim's pancreas, his gallbladder, his duodenum, and parts of his small intestine and stomach. Picture gutting a fish, Jim, a fly fisherman, said to a friend. That's roughly the idea. It's odd to say of an operation like this that a person is lucky to be receiving it, but Jim and I do feel lucky. Seven months earlier, when we went to the doctor anticipating gallstones, we learned the tumour was probably inoperable. There's a surgery that gives you a shot, Jim's doctor told us. A shot, just that. But suddenly, a shot was everything. It's called the Whipple Procedure. From that moment, our focus had become shrinking the tumour to where Jim could get the Whipple. And after eight rounds of chemotherapy and two of radiation, the day has come. The Whipple is brutal surgery in the best of circumstances. The best being a strange phrase to employ when discussing a form of cancer with a two-year survival rate of around 5%. Don't Google it, they told us that first day. But we did. The day we learned the news, just 15 months had passed since our wedding on a New Hampshire hillside with friends and children gathered, fireworks exploding, and a band backing us up as we performed a duet on a John Prine song and talked about the trips we would take, the olive trees we would plant. Each of us had been divorced almost 25 years. How lucky everyone said that we'd found each other when we did. Now, 
luck means having this operation. In four hours, luck will mean getting a call from a nurse who says, they've reached the tumour, they're going in for it. I have a book, but I keep reading the same sentence. On the other side of the room, the father and the four young people are unwrapping sandwiches and laughing. The twenty-somethings are telling funny stories about their mother. If not for the institutional decor, you might think they're enjoying a family reunion. My children and Jim's are nowhere near. I'm 3,000 miles from home. In those terrible weeks after the diagnosis, I lived with a phone on either ear, calling hospitals and researching treatments that might offer what the first doctor had not, the possibility of a future. When a programme looked promising, we got on a plane. It was in this city, at this hospital, where we found the surgeon who said, I believe I can get your husband's tumour out. Not even 18 hours earlier, we marked this moment with a day game at Fenway Park, and afterward we celebrated the Red Sox win with oysters and a martini each. Jim bought a cap. Bald for many months, his hair was back. He was thin, but handsome. It was about two years before that Jim had asked me to marry him on the deck of his Oakland, California home, with a couple of martinis and a plate of oysters. Never a skillful liar, he'd pointed me toward a particular oyster and suggested I try it. Tucked into the shell, a diamond ring. I had been single for 24 years. Just putting that ring on my finger felt odd, almost embarrassing. As later, it would be difficult to say, my husband, or refer to myself as Jim's wife. To me, marriage meant trouble, failure, pain. Why risk that again? Only I did. We bought a house, made big plans, then came the diagnosis. I think it was then, not the day of our wedding, when the words wife and husband entered my vocabulary, the first time I could speak them without awkwardness. They slipped into my speech over the weeks and months I spent navigating the world of cancer treatment, searching for the bobbing scrap of hope in an ocean of trouble, drug trials, immunotherapy, extreme diets. I expressed mailed our scans to facilities as far away as Germany, and when we were told the next appointment was three months out, I said, My husband needs to see the doctor now. My husband. At some point, I realised I no longer spoke of Jim's treatment or Jim's scan. We're on Fulfurinox now, I would say. We're getting cyber knife radiation. And then... We shrank the tumour by 50%. We're getting surgery. For years after my divorce, I'd called myself a solo operator. But I had longed for a big romance. And with Jim, I found it. The summer after we met, we saw a 1982 Chrysler LeBaron convertible on Craigslist in Maine and bought it then flew from California to pick it up. For the first time in 38 years of practising law, Jim took the summer off. We put 4,000 miles on that convertible, mostly on New England back roads. We ate lobster rolls and danced and talked about riding Jim's motorcycle across the country. Ali McGraw and Ryan O'Neill might have made it look otherwise, but cancer is not romantic. Always a lean man, Jim dropped 30 pounds. I had admired the way he dressed, conservative but sharp. Now he wore his suit like David Byrne in the Talking Heads video of our youth. When it looked as if a recurrent C. difficile infection might kill him, 
He was down to 108 pounds and dropping. I persuaded him to have a faecal transplant. Donor, me. He had been, since 13, a bass player, a rock and roll guy. Also an Eagle Scout. I loved that about him. Now, as the chemo ate away at him and his triumph gathered dust, it seemed important that he keep playing. So one day, I made paella for the whole band and their wives. But the morning of the party, the neuropathy kicked in from the chemo, leaving Jim's fingers numb, unable to play. That night, I stood at the edge of our silent yard and dumped five pounds of seafood. No rock and roll that day, or that season, or the one that followed. In the waiting room, the family across from me had brought in food for dinner. They're just opening their styrofoam containers when a woman approaches, bends to speak with the father, a hand on his shoulder. The daughter leans in, and the son, and the two others I realise must be their partners. Suddenly the room is spinning, the food drops to the floor, the father just sits there, hands to his face, shaking his head, but the children are weeping and then wailing. Someone stands, staggers, drops to the floor. They all rush out, food wrappers and bags abandoned. It can happen that swiftly, the end of life as we know it. Then, too, time can creep so slowly, even a minute seems endless. It's close to midnight when the surgeon calls. This was the toughest whipple I ever performed, he says. They got the tumour and took 38 lymph nodes. It will be another few days before the pathology report, but things look good. In the recovery room, I find the bed with Jim in it, though he's much changed from the person I met not even four years earlier, on a Match.com date at a restaurant in Marin County, California, where I kept waiting for him to suggest that we order something, but he never did. Later, he explained, I was just so knocked out by you I forgot. There are tubes coming out of him. His eyes are closed, mouth open. He looks a hundred years old, but he's alive. I'm his wife, I tell the nurse, and take my place by the bed. Jackie Weaver, reading Joyce Maynard's essay, What Luck Means Now. We'll hear more from Joyce after the break. Jim's Whipple procedure took place in the summer of 2015, and for a while, it felt like a victory for both Jim and Joyce. There was this joyful, triumphant moment when Jim emerged from the surgery, and the surgeon said to us, "Uh, this was a success, this was a great surgery. A success for a surgeon is very different, in this case, from a success for the patient. He did a really good job. And we were euphoric. But that wasn't the end of the story. My husband was not really out of pain from that moment on. Um, We went back home to California and did all the things that you do, had more chemo, uh, but the cancer came back. And uh, almost 
just over a year, a year and a week from the date of the surgery in our bed at home. Jim took his last breaths. I don't need to say that a diagnosis of a cancer like this is spectacularly bad luck. For a, a man that I consider a young man, he was 62 when he, when he was diagnosed. But having said that, I feel so lucky to have had him in my life, to have known him, and even to have walked this path I knew him. I knew him, and he knew me, and some of us go through our whole life not being known, um, and I carry that with me. It's a, it's a huge gift. Joyce says that after Jim died, she started thinking about how to spend the rest of her life. One of her regrets was dropping out of college, a decision she'd made not long after writing a long piece for the New York Times Magazine in 1972. It was called An 18-Year-Old Looks Back on Life, and the issue was published with Joyce's photo on the cover. From that moment on, my life changed. Within a day, there were a thousand pieces of mail delivered to my Yale dormitory room. And in among those letters was one completely different from all the others, which was a letter just basically saying, I have a lot of affection for that piece that you wrote. I think you're a real writer. And I know a thing or two about the perils of early success, and I urge you to be careful. You will be exploited. And the, the letter was signed by J.D. Salinger. Yes, the same J.D. Salinger that was the famous and reclusive author of Catcher in the Rye. Joyce and Salinger started writing to one another. Not long after, she gave up her scholarship to Yale to go and live with him in New Hampshire. He was 35 years older than she was. I didn't know what being in love was. I had never been in love. What it was for me was a religion. I was his follower, and whatever he said, I... I believed I must do. It was a, an extremely painful year. And ultimately, around just about exactly a year after he'd first written to me, he sent me away in a pretty painful way. That relationship ended. But Joyce went on to write more than a dozen books, marry, and have three children. And she says that despite her regret over leaving Yale, she never thought she would go back. I was carrying on with my life. I was working very hard. I was putting three children through college. And um, then Jim died. And suddenly, the thing that had seemed so far-fetched and unimaginable seemed like a real possibility. So coming back to Yale 47 years later was hugely symbolic for me. I had unfinished business, and it was honoring my own dreams, my own goals, and being my own person, not fashioning myself into who a man, however great, told me I should be. Joyce is a rising junior now, and she spends a lot of time biking through campus in New Haven. I ride past the Yale Law School every day, and it is a moment when I sometimes actually speak aloud to my husband and just say, oh, Jimmy, look at me now, how I wish you were here. That's Joyce Maynard. Her many books include the memoirs The Best of Us and At Home in the World. More after this. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. What struck me in this essay is this constantly shifting definition of luck and w how we define our lives as being lucky. And does that mean that things break our way and that we're happy and healthy? Um, well, then what is luck if illness strikes? How do, how do you define, how do you call yourselves lucky then? It's appreciating sort of the love that you share and what brought you together and what's going to 
keep you together in this case until the end and and how if the if the relationship is a good one you're inclined to think of yourselves as lucky so it was just it was an interesting sort of meditation on the word luck and how we use it and uh, how powerful it can be And here's Jackie Weaver on why she chose to read this essay. I chose the saddest one I was offered. And then I thought, why did I do that? (laughs) I kind of identified a bit, because I had a really serious operation myself only about 12 months ago in Cedars-Sinai, and it was a seven-hour operation, five incisions in my abdomen. And my poor husband sat in Cedars-Sinai for... 12 hours and I thought it's the same kind of deal and also the family collapsing in in the waiting room that's exactly what happened to my brother and my father and I when my mother suddenly died in an operating theatre so um so I identified with that bit too (laughs) when you get to a certain age you've experienced just about all of it next week William Jackson Harper. Nate was my breakup buddy. We were introduced at Scruffy Murphy's Irish Bar by a mutual friend who thought we'd like each other. And I liked Nate instantly. With his tight crew cut and animated features, he seemed transplanted from another generation. You could easily imagine him as a bit player in a 50s war movie yelling out lines like, Hey Sarge, over here! He's in a hole! Or, They shot me, Ma, I'm bleeding! Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer, Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Special thanks to Samantha Hennig, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Additional music, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.